when I was working on this talk originally, I figured a simple enough title would be CSS at Dropbox. That's the bear of what I'm talking about. And then as I worked more and more on this thing, I realized it's really about how we're scaling CSS at Dropbox. So maybe that should be the title. And then over time, I kind of realized, well, what, most of what I'm talking about is just how bad we are at this stuff. So maybe a more appropriate title would be how much it sucks. And after some more deliberations and back and forth, I figured the real title should be Move Slow and Fix Things. Um, so my name is Danny Leeden, and I'm a designer at Dropbox. I've been there for about two years now, and mostly working on revenue and growth. Uh, I recently changed roles and gave myself a completely new title of design engineer. This is a role that doesn't exist at Dropbox. It's one that I'm helping create to kind of foster connections between our design team and our engineering teams. And including my two years at Dropbox, I have about seven years of working with front-end development. And over those seven years, CSS has been the thing that's kind of intrigued me the most particularly how it scales at large companies. And today I'm here to tell a story about CSS at Dropbox. And it's one of heartbreak and redemption. And we start, of course, at chapter one. Dropbox is bad at CSS. Just how bad? OK, well, at the start of November this year, we had 1.2 thousand CSS files in MetaServer, MetaServer being the repository for all our web code. And just to put that in perspective, um, that totals about 150,000 lines of code, excluding white space and comments, um, which when you take into account the rest of Dropbox, so all the file syncing and sharing and all that stuff, CSS is 6% of that. It's kind of ridiculous, right? And so there's nothing more telling than statistics about um, some of the files themselves, so particularly main.css. We have just over 3,000 rules, 4,500 selectors, 7.7 thousand declarations. We declare float 212 times. There are only like four or five possible values for float. <laughs> we have all these 69 unique colors. Look how similar these shades of blue are. We have 50 shades of gray here. <laughs> 83 unique background colors. These are basically the same. <sighs> Every font size you could ever possibly <laughs> want. When are we ever going to use this? And then looking at the specificity graph is the most telling part, I think. We reach a peak of about 532, which is five IDs, three classes, and two elements in the same selector. So yeah, we're not very good at this. And so when it came to kind of thinking about refactoring the CSS code base, I had to go back to the start and think, OK, how could this possibly have happened to us? How did it get this bad? And it comes down to a handful of fundamental reasons. The first being that we have a lot of people touching CSS now. We have over 1,000 engineers with access to the web repo. It's a lot of potential for busyness going on the CSS. We have this all or nothing default styles way of working, which means that engineers who want to create a new feature or a new page on Dropbox.com have to come to this decision of whether they take all of main.css with them and have to figure out which styles can be reused or to start completely from scratch. It's really horrible. We have a complete lack of abstraction, meaning that the things that people do want to reuse, the buttons, the colors, the headings and font sizes, those things are all locked up in very specific and completely unintuitive classes. We have 1.2 thousand files, which means severe specificity cascade and inheritance problems. If you throw all those files into a single page, which thankfully we do not, um, but the potential is there for some serious conflicts when you introduce styles of the same selector. And generally speaking, amongst all of our incredible engineers who are some of the best in the world for writing JavaScript and Python, they're not very good CSS authors. They have a general misunderstanding of how a browser reads and renders using CSS. So at a high level, we have engineers who hate writing CSS. They're not very good at writing CSS, and they write a lot of it. We already know about 150,000 lines over you know, eight years. But even more scary than that big number is how quickly it's growing. So from June to September of this year, it's been growing at a steady rate of about 1,000 lines a week, again, excluding white space and comments. So here, these blue dots represent um, the number of lines of code, and the green bars are the number of files over time. So yeah, this is pretty bad. And this was all very disturbing stuff to learn. And I thought, we can't be the only company suffering these problems. 
And at just that thought, SASConf happened, and I saw this slide. This is from Dan Na, an engineer over at Etsy. And back in October 2014, they had over 2,000 CSS files and 400,000 lines of CSS. These are much bigger numbers than we're dealing with, which was a breath of relief for me, but also another alarming call, right? There are much bigger companies facing these similar problems. So taking a step back from Dropbox, how does this happen to everybody? On top of the reasons that I enumerated earlier, we have very primitive tools for working with, basically eyeballing. You make a change in a CSS file, you switch to the browser and refresh, and you see if it worked, maybe? If you're doing pixel by pixel changes, this is obviously an insane way of working. We don't really have like an error console like people in JavaScript do. We have extremely primitive tools. We have varying levels of browser support to deal with. I would love to use the grid module, but it only works in IE 10 and 11, kind of. Specificity is really confusing to even people who've been writing CSS for years. You can override the cascade any number of ways. It's just ridiculous. The box model is really confusing. How many of you were astounded by the fact that when you say width 100%, padding 20 pixels, that thing exceeds the width of its parent by default? It's ridiculous. And then the best practices that we now know all, now all know and love, things like BAM and object-oriented CSS, these are all really new concepts, like five years old maybe, maximum. And so at all these gigantic companies with growing uh, CSS code bases, this happens because it's really easy to write more CSS to fix your CSS. And not only are we writing more of it, but we're writing it really badly. And so at the core of this, the real problem with CSS is that it's just easy to write. And so with gigantic code bases, to newcomers and to experts alike, CSS can feel simultaneously brittle and completely inaccessible. So if the problem with CSS is that it's easy to write, then part of the solution is to have some strict rules for how to write it, ones that make you slow down and write it more thoughtfully. And this is where the best practices come in. This is where a lot of the focus has been over the last couple of years. We have things like object-oriented CSS, block column modifier, inverted triangle, which is a fairly new methodology from Harry Roberts. I suggest you all Google it, it's very cool and then namespacing to help scope styles and prevent conflicts. And this is exactly the methodology that we're using at Dropbox. For the last few months, we've been taking this approach to rewrite our CSS. And I was really excited to get in and start changing everything, start going in and rewriting main.css, killing all these selectors and everything. And in doing so, I realized just how bad it is, just how problematic being so aggressive in your changes can be. You make one change in a CSS file and it affects pages that you didn't even know existed. Which is how I got to my first emergency push at Dropbox. Um, basically, I went in and changed something about the way that our inputs and labels were rendered. Just a minor change to kind of kick labels outside the input to increase consistency across web. I made the change. Everyone's really excited about this, and I go home, turn off my computer and phone, I don't need email notifications the rest of the night. And then, just before I go to bed, I turn on my phone and find hundreds of Slack messages and emails telling me that I've really messed up. I go into the office and my coworkers, thankfully, have reverted my change, which it turned out affected a revenue generating page that we were contractually obligated not to modify in any way. We had a partnership with another company, and so this was a really big deal. This was a really low moment for me. I felt really bad, but my coworkers offered a lot of support. And one of the bright sides of this was that it triggered a conversation that needed to happen about how we should really and thoughtfully approach refactoring CSS. This was a very good thing. It got all the stakeholders in our code base in the same room to think really hard about how we can scale properly going forward and refactoring old code. Which leads me to the second half of my story. We're getting better at this stuff. And this is thanks to a few simple changes. <clears throat> the first being to quantify everything. 
I found that since the majority of my work is involving engineers who have been writing code for Dropbox for years, I need to get them excited about this project. I need to intrigue them in a way that they understand. And the way I found is that engineers love numbers. They can't get enough of them. So I've been using a few tools to kind of quantify our code base. The one I use most is just CLOCK, which stands for Counting Lines of Code. And it's a really simple one-liner to install. It's just brew or app get install CLOCK. I can show it off right now. It's really simple. But first, hey, guys. Um, so here we are in the code base. I'm going to go ahead and count all the SCSS files. And we have a lot of them, so naturally it takes a little while. But here we see 136,000 lines of code down from before. Yes, it's awesome. It's just that simple. It works on every kind of file. You can get some really interesting stats from this tool. It's really useful. Another really useful tool that I love is Parker. It's uh, this Node.js plugin from Katie Fenn uh, that helps you analyze compiled CSS. And it's the basis of what CSS stats runs on. So again, I can show this kind of thing off. So here I'm just compiling main.scss again, and then I'm going to run Parker on it and see what comes out the other side. And there we go. So it ran on one style sheet, 419 kilobytes, that's pretty big, 3,075 rules. Yeah, these stats are all really useful. You can get even more from this. I just limited it to the numerical stats, but you get things like the most specific selector and the number of unique colors, those kinds of things. And finally, one of my most useful tools is CSS stats. This is from um, Adam Moss. And it's a really useful tool. It's exactly the website that I showed you guys before with the stats of main.css. It's a really great tool for kind of showing people just how bad the specificity in your style sheets is. Second thing that we did was just start making a racket about this stuff. The first thing I did was become a blocking reviewer. This pissed a few people off because it was basically jumping into their code reviews and telling them that they're bad at writing CSS. It's really easy to do. We use Fabricator at Dropbox, so it was as simple as saying, OK, if there's a file that affects this regex, so any CSS directory or these CSS directories, add me as a reviewer. And while this kind of feels a little abrasive and rude, it's actually something that engineers really appreciate, because it gets you in at the headwaters so that you can help kind of refactor and make suggestions. Similarly, giving the engineering teams updates about the progress on CSS, either pestering them every week about how much it's growing by 1,000 lines a week or something, goes a really long way to finding the people who are interested in making a difference and helping you refactor. And finally, encouraging engineers to ask for help. Make yourself known as the authority on this stuff. Of course, you can't be a blocking reviewer on every diff. You can't go around to every engineer and teach them how to write CSS. But you can scale yourself to have the effect of doing that with things like linters and style guides. We just released our style guide um, over at github.com. So you should definitely check it out and give us some feedback. It's pretty aspirational. Um, and we also use CI testing in some of our open source work now so that when changes are made to CSS in a pull request, this tool, HoundCI, will jump in and test it against our style guide and make sure everything is up to scratch. And what are the effects of this? Well, we're already starting to see. If you move that timeline forward just a few months, you can already see the acceleration of growth is starting to decline. And this really sharp drop is actually from switching from mix-ins to just using post-CSS. It's one of the best things that happened at Dropbox. That's how we lost like 20,000 lines of code. It's insane. We also just released Scooter, which is a CSS framework it's very aspirational, but this is already going a long way to helping engineers build products from scratch, internal tools, for example, as well as serving as kind of a beacon of where we want to be in maybe 12 months' time. So it's really easy to hear about these methodologies and think that it's going to be a breeze to start using them. But the reality is it's a really difficult switch to make and could take months and years. But hopefully I've shown you guys that with the right approach, you can avoid the mistakes that I made and kind of help enact change at your companies. That's all I have. Thank you.